we're here to talk with Ian Katz, and you're here to talk with Ian Katz, about documentary and news night. But that, that's actually, to me, that's a bigger theme, because I'm a news night addict and a documentary addict, but what I admired from the beginning of Ian Katz's tenure, he arrived two years ago from The Guardian, um, is that he, he wanted to do new things on Newsnight and new things with film. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I wondered, I've always wondered whether current affairs, what's called current affairs film, isn't, isn't sort of stuck in a rut. All the films um, look a bit the same. And um, on Newsnight, films have started to be, um, look very different. And I, I think I'd like to start with just a personal homage, because I was sitting at home and watching Newsnight, as I always do, uh, an addict, and suddenly here comes a film with a man called Henry Marsh, with whom we had done a film um, two, three years previously called The English Surgeon that was shown all over the world, and it was, had a wonderful section of him doing uh, brain surgery with a Black & Decker drill in the Ukraine, and you know, he's, he, he, his book, do No Harm is a really great book and it's a bestseller. And I, I, I think of him as a sort of exemplary, um, kind of very English, very British figure. Anyway, there I was at home and I saw this film about the NHS with Henry Marsh and I was startled by it and really pleased. And let's start by, this is my homage to Ian, start off with. So Ian, that, that's like, I mean, what I loved about that sitting at home, it was like a little documentary to send you off to bed. <laughs> Um, not exactly happy, but entertained, and it, it you know, conveys a huge amount, as do good documentaries do in a very short time. I mean, that sort of, is, is that part of your new style? Um, it's definitely an element of it, I hope. Um, I mean, that, that, that film came out of us sitting around endlessly um, thinking about how to animate the NHS story, which is one of several stories that we A, know our viewers care about immensely, B, cover repeatedly, and, 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 and as a result, sort of, I think, disappear into kind of white noise. Like, you know, everyone knows the sort of core elements of the story, but we've got to find ways of telling it compellingly. And um, I think actually that particular film emerged out of the fact that, that a couple of us had read the book over Christmas, because like all things, we came to it several years after you. Um, and he just seemed such a sort of vivid and uh, engaging character so that, you know, the subject of trying to procure beds in the morning, which could be <laughs> quite dull, suddenly is entertaining and amusing and ludicrous. And so how long did it take? That, this film's, what, 10 minutes long? And how long does it take to shoot and edit that? Well, I think, if I remember, the, the whole film was made by one person, um, Stuart Denman, one of our producers. Um, it was interesting, it was one of the cheapest films we produced all year. It cost less than £1,000 in, in, in total. I think we should tell, um, you should note that. Less than £1,000. Yeah. Um, How many days shooting? Just Actually, he shot for about four days because two or three of the days that he shot on were very quiet. Yeah. Um, I think we had a total of about four days' access. Uh, and he will have made that in, in a, a week from end to end. And round about how long editing? Uh, I'm going to, I'd be fibbing if I said I knew, about, probably about two days, but could have been three. Yeah. But generally, generally, our, generally for, a, for a news night feature, uh, it's two or three days in the edit. But that's polished and it's authored and it's funny and it's cheap. Um, but it's tr the, the, the truth about that film is, um, and I'm, I'm not doing down Stuart, who, who made it, who's a wonderful filmmaker, but it's carried by him. It's yeah. carried by this fantastic um, um, character who draws out the sort of preposterousness of the situation when you're the top surgeon in your field and you're haggling over beds. Well, he's, the, a, ha the, he's the, a ham. The, he is a ham, but yes, <clears throat> he's a good ham. Um, you, when you came to Newsnight, you introduced um, the filmmaker Ollie Lambert as a filmmaker in residence. Mm. Um, tell us a bit about how that worked. What, what was the thinking behind that? Well, the, I mean, I, I, I came to, to television with knowing absolutely nothing about film or filmmaking. Um, some would still say that, that the same is true. Um, 
but I did have a sort of strong instinct. My, my background, by the way, was, was newspapers for, for 25 odd years, uh, and the last 23 of them at The Guardian. Um, and I, but but I, when I came to Newsnight, I did have a, a feeling that both, well, as a, as a viewer for years and years and years, that, that Newsnight had this wonderful reputation for stylish filmmaking. Um, it certainly wasn't um, stuck in the kind of straight news idiom. There were some lots of lovely touches to its filmmaking. Um, and it was particularly good at sort of purging the usual kind of cliches, I think, of, of news filmmaking. But I also felt that there was a slight kind of bloodlessness about a lot of the, even the more ambitious films that, that, that Newsnight made. And I think crudely, my, my sort of diagnosis was that you, 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 you had a sort of filmmaking culture that was essentially about having a story and then trying to solve the problem of how you tell the story in which inevitably the people become supporting evidence rather than the story unfolding. So, you know, bit pieces of sync are supporting evidence to carry the thesis rather than a genuinely character-driven story where you, you, you really engage with personalities and follow them through. And, of course, the best of those are ones where you didn't know the story when you started filming, um, like a lot of the films that, that, that you commission. So uh, what I was... Uh, I mean, my, my thought was just, what if we grabbed a filmmaker from a completely different sort of culture and pace of filmmaking and dropped him right in the middle of the sort of daily whirl of Newsnight? And so uh, I asked around about who was the most interesting filmmaker around, and lots of people pointed me to Ollie Lambert, who'd just done, at the time, um, that fantastic Syria film, Syria Between the Lines, and had done The T-Boy of Gaza, and uh, uh, some other fantastic domestic stuff. And um, I had a cup of tea with, with Ollie and thought it was quite an improbable suggestion. And w w within five minutes, I felt we had basically the same approach to journalism. I, in fact, I was quite cross with him because he, he came up with a line which was much better than the one that I always used as, uh, in, in thinking about long-form feature writing. He said, look, I, uh, when I said to him, what's your philosophy of filmmaking? He said, I only have, it's only one thing. It's to find the smallest window with the biggest view, <laughs> um, which I thought was a rather beautiful way of saying what I've always said to writers, which was, you know, find me small stories that tell big stories. Um, so he came and spent six months with us last and what, year. And what did he oversee editing or hang around the office and talk to people? Or what did he actually do for that six well, months? Well, I, I, I started with quite a hazy idea that it would be a mixture of sort of osmosis of him just talking about approaches to films in our morning meetings, sitting down with producers when they were going out to make films to discuss the way they were going to attack films, going out with producers uh, on films and just throwing in his tuppence worth, sitting through edits. He brought in a lot of other filmmakers who did sort of master classes for us. And all of that was interesting, but obviously harder to see the, the, the direct dividend from it quickly. What was striking was in the end, we both agreed he should just jump in and try and make some films on, on much shorter fuses than he's ever really operated on before. So he did quite a bit of that during the, during the period. I mean, these are, they're, they're not films that I identify with Newsnight. They're actually like sort of shortened, maybe well shortened, um, Storyville's that you get straight into the characters, you stay with the characters, and the characters tell you things out of which you build up something larger. I mean, the Venezuelan thing is particularly marvelous. That, that, what was that building? It was abandoned in some property crash, and then they, the squatters yeah, take it over. You, 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 yeah. if, if any of you saw, watched 24, yeah. it, was the, it was the building in, in, that, in, yeah. that, in the series when, uh, when, when um, uh, he ended up... Uh, sorry, he, who ended up there? Was it Carrie or... Homeland. It was the guy. It was the... Um, Homeland. It's Homeland, and not yeah. 24. Um, Dominic it's West. It's one of the hell holes they end up in where they get beaten uh, up and... Yeah, and what, what, right. I mean, what, what was so interesting about this film is, at the time... The, the tower was sort of synonymous with the, the hellhole in, in Homeland. And um, Ollie went there. This was entirely on his own steam. This wasn't something... He made this film, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he made the film, and it was very much his idea. Um, and actually, he came back with this rather heartwarming picture of a sort of mini sort of socialist republic operating in this one building. And actually, you didn't see... 
enough that the whole film was about 15 minutes, but actually some parts of it have been rather sort of gentrified in the terms of uh, Caracas. But what was fantastic was there was this whole society operating in this tower with um, its own set of rules and sort of effective police force. Um, and I thought was that, what, what, I mean, actually, you say you didn't think of it as a Newsnight film. Lots of people on the show didn't either. And actually, there was quite an energetic, <clears throat> to put it mildly, debate about um, what we were thinking of putting 15 minutes of um, subtitled, uh, quite gently paced film about a story that wasn't in the news, well, no one was talking about, didn't really have a sort of crash bang wallop story at the heart of it. Um, and I was really heartened by the response to it because people really, people were very warm about it. And I think partly because just visually, it's That's so sort of photographic. When, when you say that, it, within Newsnight, the, basically the old style or whatever, repertorial BBC current affairs camp, they, what do they think of these films? They, they weren't used to it or they just think you weren't doing that? So I don't think it was an old guard, new yeah. guard thing at all. It's just, that, it's you just know, that we just had a kind of debate yeah. about whether this felt right in, yeah. in a show. I mean, there's quite, uh, quite an interesting thing I think that, that we found with Ollie is that um, I think a lot of, of longer form documentaries in general, Ollie's in particular films, have incredibly slow burn starts. And that's part of their charm is that you you gradually sort of start finding your way into a character and, and they're absolutely not wham, bam, here's the story and you're in. Um, and actually, that's really hard in a 46-minute in a news show when you're surrounded by other quite fast-paced items. And what we found was quite a bit of it was about working out how long you could actually clear your throat for in, in 15 minutes in Newsnight, which you know may, maybe in a documentary it's four yeah. or five minutes yeah. and maybe in, in a film on Newsnight it's... 30 seconds. Um, so it was more, I, mean, I think even Ollie would say, it was, it, it, was, it was quite tricky finding the right speed to do slow when you're surrounded by the, the, the whirl of the day. Yeah. And did you get other, the other film was by him as well? Or? Yeah, I suppose that's the, that, that was a different kind of example. So we used him a few times where there were big running stories and we were looking for a different way into them. A bit like that sort of white noise point I was making about the NHS. One was the floods um, in the southwest where he went down, went away from where all the news cameras were and just told a fantastic set of personal stories about people just dealing with the perennial flooding. Um, and then that film was, uh, you know, we, we had very straight, as it were, coverage of Ukraine through the, 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 the period of the, the intense period of the conflict wonderful coverage actually, some of which um, maybe I'll show you in a, in a little bit, but we just wanted something a bit more textured about what it, what it was like if you were sitting on the border between uh, Russia and Ukraine and, and, and he made that film in about a week. That's pretty amazing. Um, okay, let's get the next clip, which is, these are animations you're gonna show us. Do you wanna talk a bit about them first? Yeah. Um, <sighs> Again, this was just, this is not so much uh, about documentary approach as just trying to find different storytelling approaches that work for stories, particularly stories where you don't have strong pictures. We, we started using this with um, um, migrant, Mediterranean migrant stories um, towards the beginning, I think it was, of last year, where um, you could get great interviews out of people on, on a notebook. Um, but you couldn't get them to, 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 to stand in front of a camera and tell you the story for understandable reasons. They didn't want to be uh, shipped back. Um, so we had this amazingly powerful testimony. You were seeing amazingly powerful testimony, particularly in the, in the print reporting. And we just thought, how can we, how can we bring that to film? So we started using it with the migrant story. The next experiment was around gangs, where um, we had some great stories from people who'd left gangs about life in the gangs, but again, the same problem with uh, identifying them. And I don't know about you, but I've, I'm slightly allergic to the sort of silhouette interview. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we've actually done a couple recently where I think we've found new ways of taking them <coughs> and giving them a bit of texture. and You can feel a little of the sort of humanity of the of the, of, the silhou of the face behind the silhouette, but I find them quite deadening to look at. So these were really an approach to 
telling those stories. Now, the, the, the problem that all of you have who've worked with animation will know is that it is incredibly slow <laughs> and, and laborious and expensive. So what we wanted to do was to come up with some animated styles which you could turn around relatively quickly. And we've got a wonderful graphics guy at Newsnight called Aslan Livingston Ra, who is very smart at creating these just about sort of 3D simulated worlds, um, which he can then produce short animations out of really quite quickly. So mm -hmm. both the ones that you'll see, the gangs one and the um, subsequent Ebola one we did, once he'd built his world and once we'd done the reporting, he was able to turn them around in about a week to 10 days, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is very fast mm -hmm. for this kind of stuff. Uh, these are very, um, they're actually very beautiful as well as being stylish. I mean, <coughs> is that something you work on a lot? I mean, when people work on Newsnight or watch Newsnight, do, do you find out that they say that a certain item like this was specially beautiful and charming or moving? Or how, how do you find out about that, really? Mm. Well, <coughs> I mean, the, 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 I'm always wary of sort of over... Att attaching too much significance to what people say on Twitter, because most of it's abusive. Um, but um, actually, it's a brilliant um, feedback. It's a brilliant feedback mechanism in that it's completely instant, um, so you don't even have to wait for the, the logs of people who've bothered to call in to the BBC each night or, or mail you. So you do. You, you instantly see when something like that goes out. And you see people start talking about it and saying even just that it looks different or feels different. Um, you, you get a sense of that. Um, but I think I, I was particularly pleased with the um, aesthetic of the Ebola film because in a very simple way, he seemed to just capture this sense of menace in the air. I mean, that shimmering effect that he creates um, just, to me, was every bit as vivid as... And we, we did send... We actually sent a team out to uh, Liberia who produced, you know, I, I think some of our best stuff last year, um, and it was really, really shocking. But, you know, at some level, with a big running story like that, when you've seen those incredibly shocking images mm -hmm. um, four or five or six times, you just become inured to them. And for me, this film, which we ran at the end of the year, when people had seen an awful lot of Ebola, just created a, a, a different way of representing it that I think brought the story home. L the next clip is... Is, it's about sort of what you call co-productions. That's really about how you work within the BBC to enhance the limited amount of money you have. Could, could you tell us a bit about that? How, how, how does the BBC co-produce with itself? Right. Well, so, so you know, well, one of the constraints we're working under is that Newsnight's budget is largely tied up in our own filmmaking team, uh, which is wonderful. Um, but it is heavily... How, how many are there about? Well, the whole of the Newsnight team is about 50, uh, of which there are something like a dozen... There are about a dozen correspondents and about 22, I think it is, producers. So the rest of that team are cameramen, um, assignments folks, um, editors. Um, but that's, that operation is... I mean, we, we make typically two to three films a day, and that... Uh, so, so we made two to th three films on the day and then we're typically making one slightly longer burn film that's coming through on that might be on a one week fuse or a three week fuse so it's quite hard out of that structure to carve out people and say right you can have um, three or four weeks to go and you know, sit in the med and, and do a, a fabulous film about uh, mi migrant rescues um, and our actual uh, pot of money for commissions is, is relatively small, although we, what we're trying to do is to carve out from other parts of the budget some, some, some extra funding for that. That's the downside. The upside is that the BBC, it, there is incredible scope to do collaborative stuff with shows like yours or Storyville, where, as you know, we've, we've, we've run some, I think, quite successful cut-downs of stuff that, that you've um, had in development, like India's Daughter, um, or indeed the, the, the Gatekeepers, which we ran in its entirety with a, with a Newsnight uh, discussion off the back. Um, we do quite a lot with um, Our World, um, which is a half-hour uh, strand on, on the news channel. Um, and actually, that works really well. We co-commission with them. 
Um, so rather than ending up trying to take a sort of 10 or 15 minute cut down out of an hour or 90 minutes, we're actually conceiving it as a you know, 12, 15 minute film and then a, a, a 28, 30 minute film separately. And I think that works quite well. And one of the films that we're gonna show okay. Uh, is about... Um, uh, are you effectively enhancing their budget or do you pull your budgets? How does that work? <laughs> well, we both, it's like, I think it's like any, any other yeah. co-production, we, we both throw in um, yeah. uh, and there'll, there'll be a haggling session and um, these budgets are very small by and large. Um, but actually, to, you know, there's, a, there's a very good example at the moment of a film that we're working on where, um, uh, in fact, they're, they're just in the edit this week, We've been on a, a vessel in the Med um, picking up uh, migrants. Um, it's very expensive. It's very expensive to be out there for a week with a team of two or three. We wanted to do some more sustained reporting, so we didn't just do a sort of smash and grab on the rescues, but we followed through on some of the stories of the people when they arrived on land. We wanted to spend some time in the, in the camps that people are brought into. So all in all, you're talking about a sort of two or three week at least uh, reporting commitment and then at least uh, probably for about a week in the edit. Um, and actually what we managed to do there is produce out of that a, there'll be a long news night film next week. There'll be a, an hour world at half an hour. There'll be a digital first, uh, longer digital film. There'll be a couple of hits on the, on the news. We've already had a sort of couple of taster hits on the show. So actually that way you can pull money in from quite a few sources and it feels like it really justifies the spend for us. So we're going to see a bit of India's Daughter and a bit of a film about a piano in Gaza. Just um, remind people about the India's Daughter explosion rather than me droning on about it. You tell. Well, I, we went to Newsnight because we, we wanted to get India's daughter out to as many people as possible. And, and what we love to do with Ian is get, you know, eight, ten minute cuts of our films. And we don't do it enough. But um, this was particularly remarkable from my point of view because I just, I became aware of two things. Firstly, how extraordinary at its best the BBC machine is that you can just walk in with a film. And in an afternoon, they've taken a, um, an hour long film and they've cut a really very good seven minute version of it and they just know how to do that very fast <clears throat> it also had a very for me a very very good effect because it got the film out um precipitating um angry letters and legal threats from the indian government which enabled me to get the bbc to move the transmission <coughs> of the hour-long film up rapidly so that you know it became a fait accompli we were not obliged to discuss with the Indian government whether the film would be shown because the film had been shown and, and therefore we got on past, in theory at least, past the legal discussions about the show to actually talking about rape in India. I want to ask you, coming from <coughs> illustrious years at The Guardian and dealing with television journalism, television reporting and films, I mean, how difficult, how different is it um, do, you, do you have to adapt a lot, or do you just find you mm. can use your intelligence in one medium and then another very easily? Mm. Well, I think, I mean, the journalism at its core is, is the same. Uh, it's about finding great stories and telling them in, in the most powerful way. And that's why I bonded with Ollie Lambert, because actually, you know, that, that smallest, smallest window with the, with, the, with the greatest view is, is just, I think, the heart of great storytelling. Um, I guess, I mean, it's interesting that those films illustrate some of the relative um, challenges, advantages and disadvantages quite well. I mean, the thing that, that does drive me nuts is a bit too strong, but I do find <laughs> intensely frustrating, is that <clears throat> the, 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 the dividend, if you like, the, the, the uh, um, I, was, I was talking about the density of reporting. Right? What, what I love in, 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 a, in, a, in any kind of journalism, you've, you feel it the best when you read The New Yorker, is you can feel how many people someone has spoken to. You can feel how, how grounded what you're reading is in lots and lots of conversations and interviews or, or, or long conversations with one person, but, it, but you can feel the shoe leather that's gone into producing something. And often in print, it's multiple voices. So, you know, I, I read a wonderful piece. There's a fantastic piece this morning in the, in, in the, in the Guardian, on the Guardian website, which is following one migrant from Syria to, to um, Sweden. 
It's just got this fabulous density of reporting. And what I found a, a sort of shock coming to television was it's so much harder. You know, every hour you put in gets you not nearly as much reporting because of the faff of just operating, and particularly you know, when we're operating with teams. The, the example we talked about before was uh, the uh, Kenyan mall bombing happened, uh, an attack happened more or less when I joined. We sent, in fact, that reporter you just saw doing the, um, the Gaza story, Tim Hill, who's a brilliant reporter, uh, we sent him out to say, look, let, we've got wall-to-wall -wall news coverage of this um, attack. Let's just take a sort of three or four-day breather and, and see if you can give us sort of reconstruction of as much as you can. And he, he, did, he produced a brilliant piece, but it had perhaps four or five voices in it. And I know the equivalent print piece would have had a dozen or more voices in it. And so I'm always... I'm always just a bit frustrated by how hard it is to get the same sort of density of reporting into television. Is that, is that television. a time factor, or is it that an editing factor that's simply more difficult to get many voices into a linear narrative? Well, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely the case that I mean, some of the most powerful stories are told with fewer voices. And, but, but I think sometimes to get those voices, you need to discard lots. You know, you, you, you need to sort of... You need to kind of home in, don't you, on your, your, the, sort of the characters that really tell it. I just think that the faff of, of, of setting up filming and getting yeah. people to appear in certain places in front of the camera is just a lot tougher than, uh, than is showing up with a notebook, sometimes just being there with a notebook. But the flip side of it, I think, is that, is that Gaza film. Now, you could have written that beautiful story about the last piano in Gaza... It's like a parable. <laughs> um, I was, I, I, when I watched it in the edit, I was in floods of tears. I could barely, I could barely say anything at the end of it. And it, but it but, and, and it would have been an emotional piece of print journalism, but I don't think it would have affected you viscerally in the way that hearing it and, and the layering of the, the pictures and the music um, gave it. I, I mean, I don't associate Newsnight with many floods of tears shows, but have you tried to push the proportion up a bit? So someone said to me soon after I, <clears throat> I started, always remember that, that TV is essentially an emotional medium, not an intellectual medium, which struck me as a bit of a problem, given that Newsnight is essentially <laughs> an intellectual show. Um, but I think we, we have tried to dial up the kind of gut quotient, if you like. I mean, I, I, do, I feel frustrated when I watch a show that doesn't touch you emotionally it doesn't make you feel something and uh, we do produce plenty of those shows um you know but i rolled in uh, slightly late last night and watched the show and, and you know there's a lovely lovely film from the um annual uh, gypsy festival um which takes place somewhere in the northeast i forget the town and um it was just a it was it, was, it wasn't there was no real story but it was just a lovely affecting human piece of film at 11 o'clock at night I, I wanted to, to show that just because I think that, 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 and that's another quite interesting strand of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so one of the challenges for us, I think, is to, uh, particularly, maybe more than any other show, is to operate at two really quite different speeds. So the reporter on that piece, Gabriel Gatehouse, um, who's a, a, a fantastic um, international sort of investigatively, in fact, we call him our international investigations correspondent. He's, He's, he, he, he does a lot of sort of big role, breaking news as it happens, but he also has a real bent for going back to things and digging away. He was there at Maidan when those shootings happened, and he covered it for us at the time in a series of really very fine films. Um, but then, so that was one speed, and we're always trying to operate at that speed. But what we did in this case is he, he badgered me for months and said, you've got to let me go back. And, 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 and when the year anniversary approached... He insisted, uh, um, and I have to, have to give him credit for it, that, that it would be worth just going back and, and, and having a dig for uh, two or three weeks. He actually went twice, and probably a total of two or three weeks, um, and came back with a really, I think, important investigative film about what really happened at Maidan. Um, it wasn't something that anyone else was really looking into. It it's sort of felt, I think, like a fairly sort of settled bit of, 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 of recent history, but he came back with a really countercultural film which said, um, actually, there's lots of evidence that says there was shooting that came from the protesters' side 
um, that it wasn't necessarily the, the um, Yanukovych forces who, who, who fired first, um, which was, I think, really provocative and interesting. But it also, I just think, touches on this, this theme that you're seeing quite a lot of, I think, at the moment, quite successfully in lots of different places, which is returning to fairly significant news events a year, six months later, and trying to do quite ambitious reconstructions when perhaps people who wouldn't have talked in the first few months are willing to talk. And I mean, it's, this world has done this brilliantly with um, the Kenyan Moor, we touched on that earlier, but also I thought Henry Singer's um, Baby P film was a fantastic mm -hmm. example of this on a slightly longer, a longer fuse. And this is something we're also trying to do a bit more of on Newsnet. I mean, do you take these Newsnet films and make them into full hours, or is that too difficult? I think an, an hour is sort of b beyond most of our sort of wild imagination. Um, but, we, but, but we are, so, so traditionally what's happened quite a lot is that we've worked with people like Our World or you and taken films down. So f films that were uh, gonna be an hour, half an hour, we've worked out how to cut something out of. More and more now we're going the other way where we are saying, okay, we've got a great 10 or 15 minutes and actually there's something there for a, for a, for a, for a good half hour. Typically, we're doing them with our world, um, uh, sometimes other, other strands, but that is a really interesting development. And are they shown within Newsnight, or, or they migrate to other bits of the BBC? No, so the longer form film will be shown elsewhere, okay. um, either on, 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 so we've done recently a few films with BBC Four where, I'll give you an example, we did a, um, so we, we, we did the first interview with the women, um, who were kept captive in that awful house in Cleveland, Ohio, by uh, Castro. Um, and it was just obviously a fabulous property, which I think we gave 12 or 15 minutes to, probably a good third of a news night. But they spoke to us for two hours, and we got a fantastic half hour, uh, uh, which I think was one of the best performing things on, on, on BBC Four. So we're doing more building up rather than cutting down. OK, the last clip is election coverage, yeah? Oh dear, that is so sad. It seems a very long time ago, doesn't <laughs> it? It seems, it seems like another era. Yeah, yeah. So the, this is, reflects that the, the, you, you had basically a superficially very boring but actually very interesting election and you set out to cover it in many different, often humorous ways. The, the first one about the houses, how did that work? You, you all went to people's houses and... Well, I mean, it, it was nakedly uh, inspired by um, Gogglebox and um, um, that uh, BBC uh, series, The Kitchen, which was set around meal t tables. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I mean, I've covered um, a lot of general elections, both as a reporter and as a, as a print editor. And the one thing that I, I think um, is true of almost all of them is that the kind of snow blindness sets in very quickly and there's such a blizzard of coverage that people engage actually with very little. And so at the start of, the, um, of, of planning our coverage, we, we set out to just come up with two or three things that were completely out of the register of normal election coverage that we hoped people would just sort of look up and say that feels a bit different, looks a bit different. Um, in, in the event that uh, series This House, which we ran more or less weekly, we went back to these families. We had three families around the country, one in Birmingham, that family, one in, in uh, Wales and one in Bristol. They were sort of chosen to be roughly representative of the, the, the mix of political views around the country. Um, they were very strong characters. Um, I loved it. Tons of our viewers hated it. It drove people nuts, but I was a guaranteed sort of spike of opprobrium every night on, on Twitter. What, what did they dislike about it particularly? I think people felt it was, um, well, the, the usual phrase was sort of sub-gogglebox. You know, it is sub-gogglebox <laughs> because gogglebox is absolutely brilliant at making gogglebox. Um, but it felt to me like access to the way people think, really think about politics in a more direct and unmediated way than you got out of a lot of traditional reporting, a lot of our own reporting. Um, and we did build these people as characters. So... Um, you really got a sense of them. Julia Mansur, the character in Wales, became a bit of a sort of cult mm. figure um, mm. uh, during the course of it. So uh, I, I counted that as a success because people reacted to it. Um, 
even though lots of people reacted to it uh, angrily. The other example there was, in a way, a much more traditional approach, but um, we, we asked Michael Cockrell to make a, a biography of Ed Miliband on the off chance that he might be Prime Minister, um, and gave him, I think, probably about three... I think the whole thing from, from start to finish was about three weeks, which by our standards is an eternity, and by his is a, is a um, blink of the eye. And how long, how long was that? Half an hour? No, his, his Miliband film was about, I think, about 14 minutes. Okay. But interestingly, we, we ran it on the eve of the election in a very different kind of show. So what we did that night was we had almost nothing live. Um, we just ran three lengthy films on the show. We ran a 14, 15-minute biography of uh, a Cockrell piece about Miliband. We ran a Matthew Dancona film about Cameron at a similar length. And then we ran another long film we'd made with um, Steve Smith, one of our reporters, where we sent him, again, on a sort of three- or four-week fuse. We said, this is the ultimate bubble election. They're managing to, to, to keep the politicians from real people. Your job is to prick the bubble. Just go to the bubble wherever you can and prick it. Uh, and he produced a lovely film where he, he basically made a, a sort of serial nuisance of himself, and it was very funny, and I thought made a much bigger point about where politics and elections were going. And when we, we didn't intend to schedule all these pieces together, we would not normally um, put several long films in one show and the received wisdom is people don't like that. As it is, we ran out of road because the election caught up with us and we had to run them all together and people loved the show. We had <laughs> much the nicest feedback we've had in, in a while, which maybe is a suggestion that we should do that more often. Okay, I think we're gonna go to some questions now, please. <clears throat> So, the mics. Any, any, any questions? Anyone? Yes, at the front. <coughs> well, congratulations for this uh, evolution of uh, News Night, because I think that using documentaries like you have been doing is a fantastic way to convey information in a new way. So, well done. Well then, I just have a doubt. Um, documentaries in this short form, they're very difficult uh, to be made in a kind of impartial, balanced way. Because of course a documentary follows one voice and tries to build a character. So are you worried or are you thinking that you're going to be able, for instance, to cover with documentaries very controversial political subjects, such, for instance, as the Brexit, the European referendum? Because uh, I've done a film on Europe which ran into enormous controversy. I've done, I've done it with Nick. And it was very, very, very difficult to, to, to put it out on the BBC. Mm. So it would be very interesting to know uh, if you think that you're going to be able to tackle the, the Brexit the referendum mm. with documentaries, because I think mm. it would be very, very important. Mm. Thank you. No, I, I, I think that is a very good point. Um, and I would say that, um, actually, I think in, in the example of your film, we ended up, I think, staging a Europe debate, didn't we, with Robert Peston, precisely to act as a sort of uh, balancer uh, of, of your film. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I am intensely relaxed about running point of view films, even about controversial issues on Newsnight, um, as long as that's what you bill them as. Um, so, you know, Henry Marsh is a point of view on the NHS. And if that was all we did about the NHS, then we'd have a problem. Um, but we've also had Nicholson and you know the people responsible for the NHS ma ma making uh, the opposite side of the argument. So I think the the beauty of being a nightly show is that as long as we attack these subjects in the round over time in a balanced and, and, and fair way, we can afford to have much more subjectivity in in individual films. Uh, and, and we've also got the, the device, as it were, of, of a discussion that we can, we can segue directly to within the show. So um, we didn't get to talk about it, but in that sequence that we showed with uh, of films with India's Daughter and The Piano in Gaza, the first film in that series was made by a, 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 a filmmaker called Manny, um, who's a, an Istanbul-based um, uh, self-shooting uh, filmmaker. Uh, and he was actually paid by, say, the children for a year to work on that subject. And then we 
bought the Russias and made something with him out, out of the Russias. Now, that was quite an internally controversial thing because, in general, the BBC doesn't, doesn't work with NGOs who've commissioned things, and that seems to me uh, a position that increasingly we're having to sort of question because, um, you know, with, with, with tight budgets, uh, you, you need to be able to work with all sorts of people as long as you feel you can guarantee the sort of editorial integrity of the, of the, of the output. And in that case, what we were able to do is say, OK, um, this was a Save the Children uh, funded project initially, but this was our edit and our film. And by the way, there's a discussion afterwards about the arguments over um, uh, refugees and, 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 and Syria. So I think we can, we can deal with those issues in the round. In, in the case of Annalisa's film, the, um, you know, the editorial policy people, I mean, they rightly, you know, they flagged up the fact that um, dealing with Europe, dealing with UKIP is highly problematic. I mean, do you, will you have a lot of, I mean, do you have a lot of that? I mean, when you say you're very relaxed, um, is, is there a sort of system, permanent system of consultation in the BBC when you get to these very big and controversial issues? Or is it quite easy? Well, um, touch wood. Um, I feel I haven't really run into the mud uh, yet. I mean, you probably all know that there is a, <coughs> a sort of internal, I won't call them a thought police because it's very unfair, but there is an internal uh, uh, department of the BBC called EDPOL, Editorial Policy, whose job it is to try and ensure that the editorial guidelines are followed across uh, all output um, I think it's a sort of Sisyphean task. Um, but um, I've found, in general, my dealings with them... I mean, the, the one thing that I've tried to instill in my team at Newsnight is the idea that we form our own opinions first of whether something is ethical, justifiable, a good thing to do, and then we open a discussion with, um, with Ed Pohl. I think that what you can get in institutions which have a sort of um, guidelines department is a tendency to go to them first to ask you what you can do, and that is deeply pernicious, and I'm, I'm very... It's, you know, it's um, suicidal, I would say. But it does, it, it does happen, I've seen it happen. Yeah. And um, <coughs> so I've tried to insist that people form their view of what they want to do, then go in and have these conversations where we can go into bat to argue the case for, for what we want to do to something. Yes, question there. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm interested to, to know what lessons, if any, you think um, other current affairs format programmes can learn from, from what you're doing at Newsnight. I'm thinking kind of panorama dispatches. Um, well, I, I, I really hesitate being so fresh to this parish myself to, 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 to dole out lessons to anyone. I mean, look, there, there is definitely a move uh, on, on, on strands like Panorama, for instance, and generally at the BBC, to doing more quick turnaround current affairs. So it's, it's absolutely an aspiration of my boss, Fiona Campbell, who runs current affairs at the BBC, uh, and people like Kim Schillingmore, who controls BBC Two. They have a real appetite for um, stuff that has the kind of, you know, some of the depth, uh, and gloss and finish of current affairs programming, but turned around in a matter of weeks. Best example, a recent example of this, I guess, is um, the quick film they did on the, on the Hatton Garden heist. Um, and th those, are, I suppose, traditionally films that you'd have expected to see more on Newsnight, and, and which uh, you know um, they're trying to work up more and more as longer form films. Um, you know, there are definitely some approaches that we've taken. So, for instance, that animation strand as a way of telling stories that just don't have the picture in it, which I think will be taken up more, have been taken up more elsewhere. You see it more, I think, with the online um, um, documentary makers. I mean, the, the, the people who are, who've done the most of this, which I really admire, are the, are the Guardian, where I used to work, who've used it incredibly powerfully around Guantanamo, uh, in fact, before I left, we had a fabulous film about the death penalty in Iran, a, a, quite a long-form documentary which was animated. So I think you'll see more of that, um, but I certainly hesitate to peddle any more. 
lessons. Okay. Another question. Yes. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Um, Ian, you've spoken about um, using animation and um, coming from an NGO myself. When you've got vulnerable people, perhaps children or, you know, adolescents, who um, you need to protect their identity or um, perhaps they're going through asylum claim or something like that, you've talked about using um, animation, which I think works really well and really love the gang film. Is there any other... You said you're not a fan of the silhouettes, which I don't think anyone is anymore. Are, are there any other kind of formats or ideas or ways of protecting identity but still giving you enough of, you know, seeing that character and building up an idea of who that person is? Mm. Um, perhaps even that you've seen during the festival this weekend mm. that you might be thinking about <coughs> moving into the future? Well, the one that I've been most struck by recently, which I think is, is incredibly creative and visually simple, is, is what the detectives have been doing. Um, I think mean, you've seen the, the, this fantastic series with the um, sexual crimes squad in uh, Manchester where they've got lots of interview material, where they've got these very, very powerful audio, but no, no pictures to go with it. And they've got these rather lovely macro shots of recording equipment. So you'll sometimes see the counter just moving very slowly. And I, I find there's something quite almost sort of mesmeric and, and affecting about that. So I found that quite refreshing and we'll be nicking that promptly. Um, um, obviously, I've seen, I've seen a bit of reconstruction while I'm up here, um, quite a bit of reconstruction. I, I saw um, a terrific film, Dark Horse, about the, um, the Welsh uh, racing syndicate where they came quite late to the story. Um, they, they were working backwards to tell a story that was already substantially unfolded and they did a lot of reconstruction that I found very powerful. Um, I quite like impressionistic rather than literal reconstruction. Um, <laughs> so I did see something, I don't know, where did I see it? And I thought we should nick that too. Um, actually, I think it was in, in, in Dark Horse of some, just some very kind of moody reconstruction of motorway driving scenes. But the, the, the heart of it for me, the difficult thing is, 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 is what carries, you know, you can, you can fill the time, but what, what carries the emotional punch of the pictures? And, the thing that I felt about some of the animation, not all of it, um, we particularly did a film about Rwanda for the anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, where I thought there was something about the animating style that carried this similar sort of emotional punch to actually seeing the face. And that seems to me where the real challenge is. Another question? Uh. Yes. Hello. You talked a lot about sl like slow burn films. I wondered if you thought about if Newsnight will be doing any digital films because there's been a lot at the, at the festival about digital films and about how they're usually a lot shorter. You've got to grab the attention a lot quicker because people are looking on the train and things like that. Are you thinking about doing any digital films? And if you if you do, we have to approach them differently. Mm. Well, we, 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 we've really got kind of um, learner wheels, stabilizers on, on that front, but we have done um, some. So one of the first things I did when I arrived was to open a YouTube channel, which I think may have been illegal at the BBC, but um, I seem to manage to get it out under the, under the radar. Um, and really, that was, that was really because I was struck by the fact that people were often talking about things that ha had happened on Newsnight, but they didn't have a link to share. And so you had this sort of slightly isolated um, conversation. And, but what we did learn quite quickly was that um, you know, every so often we would have something that would catch fire and thousands and thousands of people would look at it, but most of our stuff actually would do very modest, to put it politely, traffic. Um, and so we, and we kind of got the message that actually you, if you really want to set YouTube on fire, you have to think quite hard about what works on YouTube. And one of the first experiments we did, I thought was really interesting. We, we had, um, so com coming back to Maidan, which I showed, there was a very um, good uh, cameraman producer on our initial coverage of Maidan called Jack Garland. He was working with uh, Gabriel Gatehouse. And Jack had shot 
you know, hours and hours of footage of which we ran, I suppose, in the first week, two or three films at about six or seven minutes. And he, and he just went ahead and made a raw, uh, I think about 20 minute film, um, which he, I don't think he even told anyone about, he just made it and stuck it on the YouTube channel. And actually that, that got fantastic traction. Um, and I think it, it appealed to that, um, I, I think there is a whole audience out there with an appetite for a far less mediated form of, uh, of coverage. Um, so this was largely reporterless, it had no track, it had no traditional sort of structures or, or tropes of, of, of current affairs journalism. Um, and I think people really sort of reacted to the, 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 the rawness of it. And we've done a little bit of that since. I mean, at the moment, I feel that we are um, a bit too stretched on the filmmaking front to do dedicated, long-form digital stuff. We are doing quite a bit of short stuff. So... You know, we might just shoot something on, a, on an iPhone or, well, you know, a, a crew that have been out to do an interview might just shoot something extra, which we'll live. Digitally at the moment, we're putting our main effort into text because we've just launched, during the election, we launched a thing called Newsnight Live, which was a sort of live rolling blog. And bizarrely, the bit of software that we use to do that can't embed video at the moment. So we're, 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 I've brought text to, 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 the, to this operation. We're, we're, we're promised that we will be able to embed video soon and then it will be quite an interesting challenge to start seeing what we make specifically for, for the digital platform. I mean, the, the Guardian one embeds video footage and so does the Telegraph. Was it... How come it... Yeah, oh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm no, going to watch mind. what I say here. I, mean, I think... Um, um, <laughs> never mind, never mind, never mind. I mean, actually, to be honest, the, the BBC has lots of ways of, 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 of publishing video mm. um, on its own website. The difficulty is... You know, YouTube is where the conversation is, isn't it, about um, uh, video online. And so what you really want to do is just be able to throw up stuff onto YouTube really quickly and embed that. And that is coming. That is something we're going to be able to do soon. How do you feel about the um, less mediated um, editorial attitudes of Vice? Is that attractive to you? Yeah, I'm a real fan uh, of... Um, I'm a real fan of Vice, actually. I always think one of the interesting things about Vice is people think it's, it's um, um, fabulously sort of loose, gonzo journalism, and it's all just, you know, let it all hang out, you know, shoot it as it comes. Actually, it's highly produced, um, it, it really intensely produced, and, and that's why it's so good. But I did, I did think that with Ukraine particularly... I forget the name of the guy who was uh, their, their main reporter there. Um, Simon Ostrovsky. Ostrovsky, the guy who got, who got detained for a while. I thought he was really fabulous, actually, and I thought he brought an, an incredible sort of sense of access and energy to the story. Um, and and uh, um, I did have conversations with our guy, um, Gabriel Gatehouse, who is, is a wonderful reporter, about Simon's work while he was out there, because Gabriel was seeing Simon out there and looking at his stuff as well. And I think um, I would say that we were quite influenced by that stuff. And if you look at Gabriel's body of work on the Ukraine, there, there are, there's a lot of much looser looking reporting. There's a lot of him um, walking and talking and grabbing people, much more um, relaxed reporting style than I think you're, you're used to seeing on the BBC. So I, I am a fan of that. Another question. First, first of all, thanks and congratulations, um, Ian, because ever since you took over Newsnight, well, you spoke of eliciting emotional responses from your audience, and, um, and uh, I can certainly say my, my, my watching of Newsnight has been um, uh, very much um, enlivened by that with you know, Twitter and one hand on Twitter and the other hand on, uh, on the remote quite frequently engaging, quite frequently uh, engaging with, with conservatives of left or right um, who are moaning about your latest innovation and uh, usually defending you against them. Not always, but usually. Um, I do wonder um, if, if your freedom of action is going to be circumscribed at all in the new 
climate of uh, the second Tory administration's sort of potential attacks on the BBC. But that, that, that's a separate question. My main question is a sort of Doc Festy question that Channel 4 News used to, I don't know if they still do, I don't know how it works, have a specifically an indie fund and a person responsible for working with uh, independence and commissioning their stuff. I, I just wonder, do you have a specific and explicit sort of structure um, whereby independence could pitch to yeah. you? Or well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that, um, and I'm glad you mostly like the show. Um, uh, we, we haven't, and we've just created one, um, and, and that's a message I'm desperately keen to get out, really, which is that uh, we've done two things. We've now, uh, some of you may know Diana Martin, who um, yeah. ha is a commissioning editor in, in BBC Current Affairs, who's run the Our World Strand and, and quite a lot of freestanding commissions uh, for quite a while. We've basically nicked uh, a couple of days uh, of her, so she now spends two days with us a week working on exactly this stuff. So the, the, the longer burn projects with our own team and indies externally, the, the, the stuff that we hope will make the kind of peaks, the, the, the sort of memorable peaks in our year, and we've carved out, well, by anyone's standards, a pretty modest pot of money to work with. So we have a little indie fund, and we are absolutely asking people to bang on our door um, with the sort of ideas perhaps that you've seen here today. How, how much would you be paying roughly? Or is that an indiscreet question? Well, roughly. I, I'm, I mean, I think it's easier for me to, say, it's easier for me to talk about what we, what we typically spend on a film. I mean, we, 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 uh -huh. I, I, think the, I think the average for a Newsnight film is about 5,000 pounds. And so the, the average for, these are films we make ourselves, uh, the average is about probably 3,000 for a domestic and, I don't know, eight or 9,000 for a foreign film. Um, but we, so, we, you know, we, it's, a, it's, it's pretty tight. But we, you know, we, we, what we try and do is splash out if it's really special. So, you know, I have spent oh. 20,000 pounds on a, on, on a film if I thought it was, was really fabulous. And <coughs> frankly, when we send a reporter, when we send a team, or we send a team to do a bowler, last year it probably cost us something more like forty thousand pounds. So is that factoring in um, salaries and overheads or it's just discrete extra cost God, you know the, just... uh, there are many things about the BBC I don't understand and, and one of the things I absolutely <laughs> have never never understood is how costings work because it seems to be a combination of some cost that we are kind of committed to over the year anyway, like editing like editing shifts and crew shifts. So our film costings include edit days, crew days, uh, but not uh, generally reporting staff costs or producer staff costs. Um, so I'd, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly trying to avoid the, the, no, the, that's, that's, the, the I, question I, I, on money. I was interested because you, uh, Indies might think that, you know, we, we have this new thing called Storyville Global or World Stories, and we found a way of um, getting documentaries out all over the world. And if you if you add in um, what Ian would give you to what we give you, it, it, it mounts up. I mean, there are ways that we can, we might be able to take um, Newsnight films, make them longer and show them in the rest of the world, or at, at the very least, um, work with them and make them into different films. I, I think increasingly, we all have to start thinking about that, because as Ian pointed out, as we all know, budgets are tight. By the way, there's a session about the funding of the BBC later today, I think at 4.30, and I was told to tell you about it, and I'm telling you about it before I forget. Anyone else? Can I, can I just yes. add, just, no. just, just yep. finally to that, to that point, <clears throat> I mean, the beauty of having Diana Martin in this role is she also is responsible for our world, and what we're finding is she's very good at, you know, as, as a single point of contact, she can instantly say, right, we'll do an Our World, we'll do a Newsnight film, we'll do some, some kind of digital for, for current affairs, and that just means we can access different pots of, of cash. Sorry. I was just wondering whether you or you had any sense of whether the audience was missing Jeremy Paxman. Ah, uh, um, I didn't want to ask that question. <laughs> well, I'm missing him desperately. Um, I'm not sure if he's missing me. Um, I, do you know, I would say that for the first two or three months after he left, there was a sort of wall of... Of, of people on Twitter every night saying, Evan isn't Paxman, God we miss Paxman. Um, and that's not there now. Um, 
I suppose the, the you know the, the the clearest sort of empirical evidence here is the audience, um, you know, which which hasn't gone down. In fact, the, the newsnight audience is broadly stable over the last eighteen months for the first time in probably about ten years. I mean, the newsnight audience on a sort of ten-year view has close to halved, and over the last eighteen months or so is pretty much stable. So if they miss him terribly, they haven't deserted us yet, or maybe they have deserted us and some new, new people have come in. I mean, I think it is a different... The show does feel a, a little bit different, and I suspect some people really don't like it, and some people who were alienated by it before maybe find it a bit more accessible. Do you, do you have large um, online audiences, or is that negligible? Not, so, not very many people compared to other shows watch us on... on because we... I mean, Storyville is the same online as broadcast, so it doubles it, you know. I think that I think I think because we're basically a show rooted in yeah. the news, we, I always think it's a kind of cold chips problem. You know, <laughs> you try and watch last night. Even, even <laughs> I try and watch last night's news night the next morning, chips. and it, it does feel like cold chips. The God. change, the big change we're seeing in the audience data is people watching it in a uh, on on a tablet, uh, which the audience department tell me. I don't know how they know this, but tell me is people watching it in bed at night on a tablet. And that number is going up very fast. So people not watching That's on the great. TV. I mean, I love that idea. I'm going to start doing it. <laughs> Another question. We're reaching the end. We've got time for a few. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else? We can end early uh, if no hello? one's got any questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. Good. Um, I wanted to ask about your uh, development and production. How many weeks, if you come across a story, that is a burning issue today. Can you act upon it quickly and go out onto the scene and make a report on that for Newsnight? How long is it usually for? Yeah, I mean, that's, <coughs> that's the beauty and the challenge for us. So the beauty is, because we're a daily show and, and most of our show is geared to, to go somewhere today, tomorrow, you know, we've got the most spectacular, and the best bit of Newsnight is the assignments team, and they are just astounding. At, getting teams into the field in, in, in 24 hours or, or less. So we're very well geared to doing that. What we're learning as we try and do more of this kind of filmmaking is that we're much less geared up for the development stuff and we don't have researchers who can sit there and really do a lot of work and get the right characters in place and the right access before we hit the ground. So we're having to slightly learn to you know, load the gun before we shoot. Um, and... Um, and that, that's really been a, 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 a lesson of the last year or so. Um, well, the, the move to, to kind of longer form, how do you think that's going to affect the type of stories you're telling? Is there going to be more investigative stuff, more character-led stuff? How do you see that panning out? Yeah, I, I, I hope more of all those things. I mean, um, I mean, where, where I think this kind of filmmaking can really help us is, I'll give you a few examples. I mean, so, so the Manny film there about Syrian children. Which is great. <coughs> it's absolutely great. That, now, you may want to know about that. I hesitate to interrupt you. That, we're going to run that on Storyville Global, um, either as an elongated form of Ian's version, or we're going to go back to the original version that was cut when it had NGO money, because we, <laughs> in, in sort of a globe for reasons that elude me, don't have these same sort of problems. But it, it is really a fantastic film. And I think, I think what you have to think is that this film will, in the end, you know, Story of Global gets out to over 100 million people, one way or another. And this film will be seen, and that's increasingly the um, feature of these kind of films in many different versions all over the world. And if you are working on somewhere between current affairs and documentaries, that's what you should be aiming at. You should be aiming at seeing all the different ways from three minutes up to 90 minutes that your film can survive in and hopefully at least make money in too. Mm. But anyway, you were saying... Could you retain the rights? Yes. Yes, you should retain the rights. You should retain all rights. Anyway. I, I'm just to come back to your question about types of film, I mean, for me, what the, you know, I, I, I walk around constantly feeling guilty about 
you know, four or five stories around the world that I think we underserve terribly, and top of that list is Syria. And you know, the reason the reason we underserve it is because we can't send we can't send people it's in. Dangerous. It's just too dangerous. Um, but we've grown. We've we've just got inured to that, I think, and so, suddenly it just disappears from the bulletin. You know, it disappears from the bulletin agendas. It's even print people aren't sending people into Syria, so it just disappears completely. Even though it's a it's a raging story of massive international significance with terrible you know human tragedy at the heart of it. So, as you know, what what, what I loved about the Manny thing is it was I, I felt it was a way of getting in in a really powerful way into a story that we're just not covering. No, we need to be covering, and the more I can get like that. Uh, the, the, the better, but that applies domestically as well. So I do think that you know, Newsnight is a policy-heavy program that tends to cover things, tends to start at the heart of the Beltway. <laughs> and a lot of what we're covering is the sort of argument within the Beltway about policy, and we are not as good as we need to be about covering what the, particularly the underbelly of life in Britain is like. Um, so what I crave is films with the sort of texture. And emotional, sorry. I'm not actually choking up. Yeah, I'm just running out of voice. What I, what I crave is films with a sort of the texture and emotional heart of that Manny Syrian film about, um, you know, life on disability benefits or, um, or benefit sanctions or, as we did the other day, we, we, we ran a, a very... Um, uh, sort of unusual 15 minute or so film about one family's experience of the Troubled Families Initiative, which was really quite unfamiliar as a Newsnight film, completely unmediated, uh, just tracking their experience through it. So more of that, I do think there's definite thread around returning to big news events when the smoke has cleared a bit. And uh, we're just trying to find our feet in this, but it seems to me what we're used to is the news gang you know, rake over a story, the cameras go, there's a sort of chill out period and maybe, you know, a couple of years later or a year later, uh, Henry Singer or, uh, you know, the, the, this world or someone comes, comes and produces an absolutely sort of definitive, fabulous hour of television. And we're not equipped to do that. But there's an interesting question about whether we can go back to stories a month later or three months later. Um, you know, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about is, is this issue of um, race and policing in America. Um, it feels like now would be a really good moment to get back into that story. Mm. Um, but should we be trying to get back into it you know, at the heart of the story, or should we be going sideways? What's the there's smart a, way into it? There's a good film here called Three and a Half Minutes, which is actually 100 minutes long, but they're prepared to do a 59-minute cut if you'd like to have it in Newsnight we'd be very happy to do it for you, because I, I think it's a very good film. It follows the killing of a black teenager to... Has anyone seen it? Yeah. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, it's very could good. You, could you imagine a 15-minute cut of it? Yes, I could, actually. But that's the point. I, yeah, I absolutely could. I think the more of that, that that's done, the better. I, I think it's unrealistic to take that some of these huge films that we've always got space for, and yes, I could, and we'll be happy to do that. I think I'm being told to end now, but I wanted to say I've really enjoyed this because um, I feel I want to go and work on Ian Katz's Newsnight. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed it too, and thanks for asking very good questions, and please thank Ian. <laughs>